So a very good morning to all present here, honorable guests and dear authors. I Sumanj, uh, <coughs> I Sumanj Barwal, moderator of this session, welcomes you all to the technical session 4A. On behalf of the Global Knowledge Research Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 8th International Conference on ICT for Sustainable Development, Goa, India. This 8th edition of the conference is being organized in a hybrid mode. The physical event was held in Goa uh, on the 3rd of August and the virtual event is being held through Zoom today and tomorrow, that is 3rd and 4th of August. I hope that you all will enjoy this knowledgeable session throughout the day. So before starting with the session, let me brief you about how we proceed. So in this session, we have a total of 10 presentations. Each presenter would be getting eight minutes for their presentation and two minutes for the question and answers. On seven minutes, I'll raise a gentle reminder so that you can conclude your presentation as soon as possible. I also request all the authors to please adhere to the timings. There's another request to all the participants that you all stay connected with us till the closing remarks. If you have any query or update, then you can write it to me in the chat box. So just before we get started, let me introduce you all to the chair for this session. So for today's session, we the chair is uh, Dr. Vijeta Kumawat. Okay, you allow recording. So uh, Dr. Vijeta Kumawat, Deputy Head of the Department and Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Jaipur Engineering College and Research Center and belongs to Jaipur. She has 17 years of teaching experience as head of the department and associate professor. She has two Indian patents. She has expertise in ad hoc networks, wireless sensors, networks, and internet of things. She has 45 international and national publications. She has attended 50 seminars and workshops. She organized various conferences and seminars with IUCE and IEEE, CSI, and Department of Science and Technology. It is our great pleasure to have you uh, have you here with us, ma'am. Uh, would you like to say something before we start with the session? Uh, Dr. Vijayada Kumawat, if you can uh, hear me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful introduction of me. Um, uh, this is my second time uh, when I uh, chairing this session. And it was a very nice experience last, last time. And I hope this time um, I expect that the wonderful experience with this conference. Thank you so much, ma'am. I hope that we meet your expectation so, uh, this time too. Yeah. Uh, so I think let's start uh, with the first author. So first up, we have Gauri Amin. Mm -hmm. And her paper title is A Comparative Study of Register Allocation Algorithms. Uh, Gauri, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure. Ma'am, please present your screen. Yeah, sure. Is it visible? Uh, yes, ma'am, it's visible. You've got eight minutes. You must start. Yeah. So hi everyone, my name is Gauri Amin and me and my team are present here today at the conference. And our title for the paper is A Comparative Study of Register Allocation Algorithms. So this is the agenda that we'll uh, take you through our presentation. The intro, we have a literature review, the five algorithms that we have studied. We have the results, conclusion and the future scope of our paper. So let us start with the introduction. So I would explain in brief the background of a paper. So the domain of a paper basically lies in the uh, compiler theory. So as we all know, what is a compiler? A compiler translates a high level language into machine understandable language. So the idea of a paper is basically compiler optimization. So why do we need to optimize a compiler? Because we need to perform certain tasks in less number of time with maximum speed and more optimizations and more efficiency. So the technique which we are focusing on for optimization is register allocation. So what is the problem that we are focusing on? So registers are the hardware and those are finite in number. But when we write a program or a code, we use numerous number of registers and a numerous number of variables. 
so basically when we write a program the variables are mapped to the registers but when there are many variables we cannot map them to a limited number of registers so basically register allocation is choosing which values of variables go into which registers and when when a program runs so here are some terminologies which we'll be using in our algorithms one is the live range of variables so this is the term as you can see in this diagram we can say that variable v is live at a point p because over here there is a path from p to the end and v v has a r value but it doesn't have a left value so basically it is red but it is not defined along this path so we say that v is live so this is one of the terminologies live ranges of variables uh, these are the other terms, spilling, splitting, and coalescing. So spilling is basically when we need to allocate some variables to registers, but there are no enough registers. So what we do is the variables go back into the main memory. Splitting is we split the live ranges. And coalescing is allocating two variables to the same location. Thus, we combine the operations. Now I hand over to Mukta to explain the further steps. Uh, hello everyone. So this is our literature review table. So we have went to this papers and we have listed uh, advantages and its disadvantages along with it. So next slide please. So these are the algorithms we are going to go through. Uh, graph coloring, SSA based, linear scan tree and diffusion based. And next Slide. So first is the graph coloring. So uh, here no two adjacent nodes can be given the same color. So here the nodes are variables. It just represent the variables which are live at the same time. And the number of colors are the number of registers that are available. So here in the bottom, uh, we can also see the steps of Briggs graph coloring algorithm. As we can see, the algorithm uh, is iterative. Next slide, please. Uh, Gauri, next slide, please. So this is SSA. SSA is single static assignment. Uh, which is an intermediate representation that implies each variable should be defined only once. So it ensures ease of compiler to optimize and analyze the code. Uh, and here the allocator can expel decisions without assigning variables to the registers. So this is possible because register pressure can be not at any point in SSA form programs. So here the allocator can remove the live ranges from the program until the register pressure becomes equal to the available number of registers. So here the uh, register pressure refers to the demand of register. So here we can see uh, the steps for the SSA. So the first step is build, then spell, then use the MCS, which is maximum cardinality search algorithm, then color, and then colors. So yeah, I hand it over to Gauravi. Okay. Hello everyone. So I'll be talking about linear scan, tree based and fusion based algorithm. So first of all, linear scan algorithm. So it is a greedily, uh, so this algorithm actually greedily assigns the register to the variables according to their live intervals. So what is live interval? The live interval of an variable covers a range starting from the first time when the variable was actually alive to the end point where it was dead. It scans the program linearly and sorts the live variable according to the start point and then assigns them the variable. If two live variable happens, intervals happens to overlap, then they are given two different registers. If all the registers are exhausted and if a new variable needs a register, then the variable with the longest live interval is paid to the memory. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the next one is the tree-based algorithm. 
So in this algorithm, the main concept is to create the interference graph or the tree according to the lifetime of the different variables, which mandates the interference graph or tree to be cordial and then utilizes the maximum cardinality algorithm, MCS, to assign the colors to the node. So if the variables have the same color, they'll share the one registers and the variable having different colors will do otherwise. Uh, next is the fusion-based algorithm. So this algorithm follows a region-based approach in which the first step is, is to form the regions which are dynamic and adaptable. This region have their own interference graphs according to the live ranges that are present in that region. The second step is the graph simplification in which if the graph can be simplified further, then the spilling is not really required. And if it can't be, simp it can't be simplified, then the decision of which variable to spill is being taken in the uh, graph merging step. So the third step is the graph merging step in which the graph of all the regions are being merged and the splitting and spilling decisions are being taken in this step. And the fourth and the last step is the register assignment in which the variables are allocated with the register in accordance to the previous step. Over to Ankita. Uh, you just got 30 seconds. Can you please conclude with the presentation? Okay, we have uh, done the comparative study of all the above algorithms. And um, next slide, please. Next slide. The conclusion and future scope of our paper is our paper compares various algorithms and can help to select the right algorithm for different purposes. And the future scope of our algorithm, uh, our, our paper is the algorithm can further be studied to portray how they can be parallel and uh, concurrent computing. So thank you. And Vijeta, ma'am, any Hello. questions? Ah, yeah. 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 Uh, Gauri, please move to the. Ma'am, could you please repeat? Your voice was breaking. Gauri, please move to the, uh, the result slide. Just move to conclusion slide. Am I audible? Uh, Ma'am, actually, your voice is breaking in between. Okay, okay, just a minute. Am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Very clear. Uh -huh. just, just, just show your uh, the slide where you have mentioned the uh, results. Hmm. What basically uh, you compare these uh, algorithm on the basis of efficiency approach and uh, call scaling, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, here you mentioned the time complexity of these algorithms. Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, can you uh, tell me something about the space complexity of these algorithms? Which algorithm is better? Uh, when we consider the time complexities, we can see that linear scan, tree and fusion have the same one, which are mm -hmm. obviously better than big of n cube and big of n square. So, mm -hmm. according to time complexities, linear scan, tree, and fusion would be better. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Vari. Thank you. So, Mind Sir, please call yeah. next. <clears throat> yes, yes ma'am. Sure. So, next up. Uh, so, the next author is Kamya Sharma. And her paper title is A Comprehensive Survey on Security Aspects of Using Blockchain Technology for Digital Degree Verification Solutions. Kamya ma'am, can you listen to yes, me? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. Am yes, I audible, yes, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You are very audible. Please uh, present your screen. Uh, yes, sir. I'm sharing my screen. Sure, ma'am. 
Sir, is my screen visible? Uh, yes, ma'am, your screen is visible. Uh, you've got eight minutes, you may start. Okay, sir. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Kamya Sharma, and my presentation topic is a comprehensive survey on security aspects of using blockchain technology for digital degree verification solutions. My paper ID is 88, and both her name is Dr. Monica Gailabad. We both are from LJ University. This is the agenda of today's presentation. First, I will start with abstract, then motivation, introduction, literature survey, solutions, results, conclusion, and at last references. So the abstract of my paper is uh, recently academic universities or sectors provide the certificate to the students manually whenever they complete their degree. But whenever students apply for a job, verification is very tedious and time-consuming task. Digital documents cannot be identified whether they are fact certificate or not. In, the, in that condition, we required a secure technology, which in, we can say blockchain technology it might be the solution because it is a completely decentralized technology and it provides a trustworthy interaction among students, universities, and employers. So the motivation of my study is digital document verification process is very costly and time-consuming process. Employers cannot easily identify fact certificates or mark sheet. So there is a crucial need to upgrade traditional digital document and verification process. First of all, try to understand how blockchain technology works with the help of this structure diagram. Here we can see the each node contains the hash of the previous node, which make it secure. And the each node it holds a copy of the entire ledger. Once the mark sheet data is recorded on the blockchain, it becomes immutable. It means it cannot be altered or deleted by anyone. There are various advantages of blockchain technology for digital document verification process. It makes digital certificates tamper proof. It enhances the security and provides the data integrity. It provides transparency. Your data can be stored in a decentralized manner. And it also eliminates the need of third party. There are various literature survey papers that I have uh, studied for my research work area. And there are some authors uh, explore different types of technology using the blockchain for digital verification process. And each solution has its own benefit and challenges. So in next slide, I have explored each and every solutions which are in blockchain based. Where first one is KMI and the full form is Knowledge Media Institute. It provides an open badge infrastructure for UK higher education sector. Here open badges are stored in public blockchain. Uh, actually, we are having three types of blockchain technology, public, private, and consortium. Public means it, anyone can access the data in the entire network. Uh, private means it is managed by a single entity and consortium, which is a combination of public and private both. So in KMI, here actually mark sheets or digital tokens are stored in public blockchain, but the authenticity of the user and their achievement is very crucial to maintain. Second solution is Records Keeper. It is, it is a blockchain-based data management platform, which aims to provide a secure and transparent way to store and manage the data. It again uses block, public blockchain network and also uses proof of work consensus mechanism. But the security of the blockchain, it depends on private key. If the student private key is mishandled or compromised, it can lead to unauthorized access. Third solution is BlockCert. It is an open source project which uses blockchain technology to issue and verify the digital certificate. It is developed by MIT Media Lab. It is it actually it works with digital signature, but it requires the proper management of private key. So the insecure private key handling, it, there may be a privacy issue. The next solution is Adding CTX. It provides a decentralized and temper-proof system for storing and sharing academic credentials, achievements, and other educational records. Adding CTX, it uses cryptographic techniques to protect the uh, to maintain the privacy of the data, but it relies on decentralized identity management system, which is known as DID, decentralized identifier. So flow in the identity management process or uh, work, it could lead to identity related problems. So the next solution is the University of Nicosia and the short form is UNIC, which became the world's first university which provide academic credentials on blockchain technology. 
It uses a digital signature or SHARP 256 algorithm, uh, which linked, uh, linked with student's public Bitcoin address. A student may be unable to authorize an employer to obtain their certificate. Uh, next solution is UJNHVC, where the full form is University of Zurich Blockchain Credentials. Uh, here, the documents or mark sheet are stored in PDF file, which is then hashed or with the help of SHARP 256 algorithm and stored in smart, smart contract. But in this system, it does not use, use any uh, digital signature for authentic, authenticity of the, to, to my, or it does not maintain the authenticity of the students. The next solution is Smart Cert. It is a platform that uses RFID uh, mechanism to store the data of the students. But uh, here the university uh, stored the student details in RFID tag, which contain the information like student's name, graduation date, degree type, photograph, and fingerprints. Uh, the documents then are digitally signed, and the RFID tag it can be scanned by the verifier to confirm the student's identification. It compromises the privacy because the attacker can read the tag without the knowledge or consent of the tag owner. This is the last solution. Uh, BC Diploma, which is an online certification platform that stores digital credentials in an encrypted manner. It is not completely decentralized. Actually, it works work in a decentralized uh, manner. So the process of retrieving and verifying the certificate, it requires the interaction with the centralized system. So in the next one, this is my comparative chart of each and every solutions for digital verification using blockchain technology. But I have this uh, comparison chart, it is based on some security parameters. Uh, uh, there are various security parameters like confidentiality, it means protecting personal information. Second one is privacy, it means control your data. Integrity, it means data should be correct or it cannot be changed by someone else. Next property is known repudiation. It means party cannot deny the transactions once they join the transaction. Authenticity means it validates validate the identity of the user. And last one is data provenance. It, it means uh, it provides the traceability of the data. So here, yes means it provides these security features and no means there is some security gap. So each and, all have, each and every solutions have some uh, advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, some provide the security in some manner, but some does not provide the securities. So the conclusion of my paper is uh, blockchain offers a solution for digital verification process, but there are still some challenges that I've identified that I've addressed based on the security parameters. So in future research directions, we need to implement a secure verification solution for education sector. Thank you, ma'am. Do you have any questions from your side? Yeah, yeah. What is the uh, you have? Uh, what Sorry, is the security challenge? Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Huh. What is the security challenges uh, we face in the concept of blockchain? Ma'am, actually, there are various security challenges, and uh, uh, each solutions have not full, not provide full fledged security. In some algorithms are having confidence confidentiality issue. In some solutions are having authenticity issue. So there are various security challenges. Okay, uh, what is uh, one term you use? Non repudiation in your means, result page. Yes, what is this? Yeah. It means it does not provide traceability of data. You cannot trace your uh, your data is transferring from uh, where or it is transferring from, you are sharing your data to whom. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, very good presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kamya, ma'am, and thank you, Vijeta, ma'am. Uh, let's move to the next author. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So next author is Arpita Patel and her paper title is Antenna at Terahertz, terahertz Band Challenges, Fabrication and Specification. Arpita, ma am, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. You may please share your screen. Okay. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Uh, yes, ma'am. It's visible. You've got eight minutes. You may start. Okay, fine. So uh, my name is Arpita Patel. Uh, I am uh, working as an associate professor at Charotar University of Science and Technology, Changa, Gujarat. 
and um, I am going to present my paper on antennae tera, uh, terahertz band uh, with the challenges fabrication and its specification. Uh, my co-author name is uh, Ms. Poonam Thanki and she is also from the same department. Uh, my paper ID is 55. So this is what the agenda of today's presentation. Uh, um, I'll take you through the abstract, the introduction, uh, terahertz antenna challenges, uh, fabrication, measurement techniques, conclusion, and then uh, we'll jump on to the references. So uh, we know that in current era, the ever increasing demand of the faster data rate has brought in revolutionary change in the domain of wireless communication. And the modern miniaturized gadgets requires a very high communication data rate so that uh, we can have the high speed communication. Uh, and in the upcoming future, the utilization of the minimum, uh, sorry, millimeter wave spectrum will not be sufficient to meet this requirement of the next generation applications. Because the next generation commercial and civilization applications will require the gigantic data rates like in um, terabits per second. Uh, with a huge channel capacity. So the terahertz band wireless communication can be considered as in the potential option or let us say the key factor to satisfy this uh, requirement of the next generation uh, communication applications by exploring its uh, massive frequency spectrum. So this is what the uh, frequency spectrum and the frequency band of terahertz band region is between 0.3 to 30 megahertz. And this region lies in the infrared and uh, microwave bands. And this region is generally famous as the terahertz gap. So the terahertz band or terahertz gap is the uh, same uh, words goes to this terahertz uh, uh, spectrum. And um, these terahertz bands are thought to be an extension of the microwave or let us say the millimeter wave frequency bands. Uh, it provides the more transmission capacity and then the uh, existing frequency range so that we can uh, come up with the solution for the requirement of the next generation wireless communication. Uh, one of the major advantage that this band will offer will be the wider bandwidth. And the terahertz band is more secure in the spread spectrum technology than the microwave bands. So therefore it is mainly used in the variety of applications like broadcasting or in satellite uh, mobile communication, in the explosive or weapons identification, in the multimedia, in the environmental sensing, let us say in radars and in the medical imaging also. So the breadth of this application uh, uh, results in the tremendous research and technical advancement in this particular area. So um, uh, the to explore the advanced antenna which are operating at the terahertz band will become very much essential. Um, so this is what the introduction uh, to the terahertz band antenna that they are uh, small in size, but yes, they provide the wide bandwidth as we have discussed earlier. And uh, uh, this antenna in order to transmit and receive the signals, right? They, uh, it has a very widespread growth. So uh, the uh, literature review, which has been uh, covered through this uh, throughout the paper that we are going to discuss. Before that, let us discuss that what are the terahertz band antenna challenges that uh, we will be facing uh, when we are going to fabricate it in future. So the high path loss will be uh, the first uh, and extremely um, challenge for this terahertz band challenge. Uh, the second one will be uh, the shape and material will of course affect the manufacturing cost. So the cost would be the next uh, challenge. Uh, since uh, the traditional antennas right that we are using right now, its manufacturing process will not be useful to solve this uh, advantage of the terahertz band frequency because uh, the terahertz band antennas, uh, when we are going to fabricate it, we required a very smooth surface finishing. So that's why the uh, traditional antennas uh, or its fabrication or measurement techniques are not useful at the terahertz band. Uh, let us talk about the material. So graphene is the most suitable material for the terahertz band antenna. Um, but uh, the graphene also has some challenges uh, when it comes to the fabrication process. 
so uh, these are the fabrication uh, or the terahertz band antenna challenges now uh, we'll take you to the literature review of the uh, latest terahertz band antenna so the first figure that uh, we are seeing in the uh, left hand side which is green in color right so in this section what we'll uh, do is we'll study a various terahertz band uh, terahertz band antenna which has a uh, super wide bandwidth and a uh, uh, few of the antennas will achieve the high gain right which is required for the 6g communication so uh, as we have discussed in the previous terahertz band antenna challenge is that graphene is the most suitable applicant for the terahertz band radiator and because it has a very high electrical conductivity compared to the gold and silver so uh, the graphene based 2 cross 2 mimo antenna is shown on the left hand side right this antenna is using a polyamide substrate which is uh, in the circular pad shape, right? We can see the circular pad shape Yagi antenna over here. And it, uh, this particular antenna is operating in the three bands, uh, which is ranging from one to 30 terahertz. And uh, this antenna gives uh, the ultra wide bandwidth of 10.96 terahertz band with the isolation of minus 26 dB. The next antenna that we are seeing on the right hand side, uh, it has the circular polarization and which is in the Y shape, right? And uh, by adjusting the conductivity of the graphene, right, uh, we have uh, discussed recently that the graphene has the high conductivity. So in this particular paper, the author has, you know, changed the polarization or changed the conductivity of the material to um, have the more uh, polarization in the uh, design. So it has the two symmetric orthogonal arms, which are the main key, which is the main key point of this particular design. So by adjusting the length of these two arms, right, the author has achieved the return loss, uh, which is more than 12 dB. Now the various uh, shapes of the terahertz band antenna has been uh, reported in the literature nowadays. So uh, we can uh, now uh, we'll see that on the left hand side, there is a jasmine shape antenna, which has been proposed um, with the co-planner waveguide band feed. It is given as, as the feed. And this particular antenna uh, covers the band of 0.65 to 100 terahertz band, and it has the omnidirectional radiation pattern. On the right hand side, we can see the carpet uh, uh, shape design, right, which is also proposed in the literature, uh, which is uh, again, once again, the ultra wide band antenna, which can be used for the 6G communication in future. The next is the butterfly shape. Sorry antenna. for interruption, ma'am. You just yes. got 30 seconds. Please continue. Okay, sure. So uh, in the upcoming slide, we will see that there are various antennas in the various shapes, right? So this is the uh, butterfly shaped antenna. Then again, we have the inverted K shape antenna, which has been proposed in the literature. On the left hand side, again, we have the nature based plant shape antenna, then windmill shape antenna. The hexagonal and elliptical shape antennas are also uh, reviewed in the literature. The DNA shape antenna is also there. And one single elliptical ring kind of antenna has been also proposed in the literature. So these are the, some fabrication technologies for the terahertz band antenna, which has been mentioned. And I have uh, just listed a summary of the recent fabricated terahertz band antenna. So this is what it, and these are few uh, pictures of the fabricated terahertz band antenna. Few measurement methods are also there. So as I have discussed that the traditional antennas measurements is not useful for the uh, measurement and fabrication of the antennas at the terahertz band. So these are few terahertz band measurement techniques. So the conclusion of uh, the paper is that in this paper, I have given the general idea of uh, various shapes and size of the antennas at the terahertz band, its challenges and the fabrication and measurement techniques. Though this antenna has a very good performance, but still they are not adequate for the terahertz band system. So uh, for the future point of view, we can say that the further optimization is needed and few more, uh, you know, the uh, instrument should be there to measure its uh, radiation pattern and to measure its frequency. Okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you are not Arpita? audible. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Uh, am I audible, Arpita? Yes, 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 ma'am. Now you are audible. Hmm. 
uh, you have uh, mentioned the different different shapes of this antenna right 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 so right. uh, 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 the uh, different different shapes uh, uh, will uh, affect the efficiency of this antenna yes ma'am of On, course uh, the shapes the will affect yes ma'am by varying the shapes and size of the antenna the authors or we can you know change the polarization and we can of course change the frequency so ultimately it will lead to the efficiency also which shape is uh, better uh, according to uh, this terahertz band antenna this uh, jasmin shape and windmill shape antenna has the um, good performance And this these windmill two shape. shapes will give the best results yes this windmill shape and uh, this jasmin shape antenna has the best result in terms of okay. the efficiency and in terms of the frequency okay okay uh, thank you yeah thank you ma'am thank you arpita so, ma'am now we'll move to the next author <clears throat> so the next next up we have apurva thorat and her paper title is classification of pomegranate fruit disease using cnn apurva yes, ma'am i am audible yes so good morning uh, good afternoon all of you so i will share the screen is my screen visible yes it's visible uh, you may start so, so good afternoon one and all present here my topic uh, for today is classification of pomegranate fruit disease using cnn and our group members are apurva kulkarni damayanti chavan mansi doshi and our mentor is uh, ashwini jarai ma'am and we are all from international institute of information technology pune so this is the content of today's ppt so the introduction for this uh, study as uh, we all know that pomegranate is an essential fruit and it has various uh, various uh, health benefits and economic value pomegranate is grown in various parts of maharashtra and it is and it contributes about 90% of the country's total pomegranate production but uh, the various diseases present in this fruit can can affect the quality of fruit and also which uh, it results in huge economic loss and farmers have to um, continuously check and detect if there are any diseases present in the fruit farmers observe this uh, observe this visual symptoms by the naked eye uh, where the diseases are present and the fruits are not so for uh, detection and prevention uh, of these diseases farmers uh, farmers also required uh, help of some professional experts but uh, the consultation charges of such professional experts are high and sometimes the farms are located in some remote location so it is uh, not possible always to get this um, get the services on time so it, so there are need, there is a need of some automated system such that the early, uh, the detection of the disease can be done in the uh, in the early stage so uh, before before uh, starting with the project we first we first uh, studied the we first uh, try to study the domain knowledge of this like how the <clears throat> what are the diseases present in the pomegranate and how how can we how can we identify and understand this with the help of our naked eye first so that we can form the database then uh, also we have studied various literature papers uh, research papers and we have also studied uh, we have also studied papers who made uh, research in various other fruits like apples oranges and grapes but uh, we have take uh, we have considered the pomegranate fruit so there are different types of diseases found in different fruits and in pomegranate there are basically three types of diseases that is anthracnose bacterial blight and cercospora and um, and then uh, by studying the research papers we found that bacterial blight is the most common type of diseases found and almost uh, most of the papers have focused on this diseases but we have considered all three types of diseases <clears throat> and then um, we have created the database by manually capturing the images from the farm and also we have taken help of the domain expert so that we can uh, identify the fruit whether it is healthy or if it is having some kind of disease and what kind of disease uh, it can be uh, identified based on the pictures so we also we have gained some do domain knowledge from the domain experts 
and then uh, um, after creating the database our next step was to select the best algorithm uh, so that the result can result can be uh, accuracy can be maximum better results can be uh, found and then for this we have used the deep learning model that is vgg16 algorithm for classification of disease foods and we have used the tensor flow framework for building the cnn model we have also created a web portal where the end user can upload the uh, image of the fruit and the system will accurately predict the disease of that leaf so the motivation behind our uh, topic was for um, selecting the topic was there are uh, research is found in various other types of fruits like apple grapes and oranges deep learning techniques are used on that other fruits but in pomegranate there is not yet much explored pomegranate fruit is not yet much explored so that that's why we have selected this fruit then the system the system can help the farmers to identify the disease and in overall uh, and this overall system can help in uh, improving the quality of the fruit and also it can uh, reduce the economic loss and our um, and this um, and this main motive is to help the farmers to yield the production to uh, to increase the production and uh, reduce the economic loss and also uh, after studying this all uh, we have we have get got the opportunity to learn new algorithms explore them and find the algorithm which gives the best result so objective our objective is to classify the pomegranate disease fruit into its four types means there are total three types of diseases but our four class is healthy fruit that is image of a healthy pomegranate fruit and we have used this uh, algorithm called vgg16 to create the data set by clicking uh, images from the farm our main uh, objective was classification but we have also created the database by clicking the images from the farm this uh, um, Our, ob our objective is to help the farmers to detect this pomegranate fruit diseases in early stage to design and develop an efficient deep learning model with a high degree of accuracy upon sufficient training we have trained the model and we have uh, we have trained it uh, until we have got the sufficient uh, got the better accuracy and then compare the results of the previous system with with our system so these are the various uh, literature survey we have done the first paper is diagnosis of pomegranate plant diseases using neural network in this project they have used uh, they have used if this slide okay uh, skip this literature survey come to the next slide yes so uh, uh, so our problem definition is classifying the classifying the disease fruit images into its uh, type so if the image which is of another fruit or any other image then it is, it can detect that it is not a pomegranate so existing system as we have as, as we have studied various research papers the existing system they have created their own data set and then they have for feature extraction uh, most of the papers have used k means clustering and artificial neural networks and uh, all of the uh, all of the uh, research papers have used SVM model and their uh, accuracy is around 90%. And this is our proposed system. We have collected the data set from the farms. Then our next step was feature extra extraction. We have done the feature extraction using the convolutional neural network. And then the third step was to classify into four types of diseases. And in this technique, we have used transfer learning. This is the architecture of our system. the first is we have collected the data set then we have pre processed the data set and data augmentation is applied to improve the data set like uh, to increase the size of the data set or to um, make the data set more better and then feature extraction is done and after that classification is done into its four three types of diseases and four classes of healthy fruits so we, uh, we have collected the data set now our first task was to create uh, collect the data set and we have visited the National Research Center of Pomegranate in Solapur, and we have taken the help of the domain experts to learn about the different uh, types of diseases in pomegranate and how to identify them. And with the help and with the help of them, we have uh, clicked images, and total we have five uh, sixty-two images divided into these five classes. So sure, this is sorry the... for interruption, Apurva ma'am. Uh, it's time. Can you please conclude? Yes. Yes. Sir. so we have a uh, cnn we have used cnn pg16 these are the algorithms 
one second, one second. Uh, Apurva, I am audible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you tell me what is the uh, what is the what is, what is the mean of CNN which is used in your uh, algorithm? You use CNN. Ma'am, actually, uh, we have used a uh, VGC sixteen model. It is a mm -hmm. pre-trained model that we have used, and that model consists of sixteen layers. So it is a okay. pre-trained model and it is easy to use and we have uh, and we have used various types of algorithms and among this we have got best results using VGG sixteen. Uh, how much accurate results uh, uh, you achieve in your uh, by using this algorithm? Now, as we can see, um, one second. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. For training accuracy, we have ninety nine percent, and testing accuracy, we have ninety six percent. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Apurva. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Ah, uh, thank you, Apurva, ma'am. We'll be moving to the next author. And next up, we have Somabha Mitra. And sorry for if I mispronounce your name. And the paper title is "Detection of Autism Using Artificial Intelligence." Can you hear me? Somabha, are you in the meeting? Hello. Um, am I audible? Ah, uh, yes, sir, you are audible. I think Can then Somaba is. In... Yes, ma'am, that's what I was going to say. So we'll move to Rushal Patil, and his paper yes, title sir, is. Are... If... Uh, can you please uh, repeat who who said? Yes, sir, we are here. Uh, can you please tell your name? Acha Rushal Patil. Rushal Patil. Right, right? Yes, okay, sir. Okay. Uh, so your paper title is Event Management Using Blockchain. Yes, you may present your screen. Yeah. Uh, sir, can you start? Uh, yes, Hope sure, my screen is start. visible. Yes, it's visible. You've got it. Yeah. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, myself, Parth Chedji, and my colleagues are... Uh, Rishal Patil, Mayur Patil, Saloni Nimgaonkar, and Professor uh, Ajay Tandeve. So our topic is event management system using blockchain. Next slide. So uh, wh wh why why is this necessary? So let's talk about that. So there were some uh, major challenges in the current ticketing system. So the first challenge was ticket scalping. So this means that uh, tickets were bought and resold at inflated prices. depriving the genuine fans of uh, attending events additionally uh, there were also uh, fraudulent tickets that can be circulated in the market leading to financial loss the next the next problem was centralization and control so what happened was there were intermediaries between uh, event managers and uh, customers that cost uh, that costed lot of high fees uh, for the customers and they very tightly controlled the ticketing system so this also causes to the uh, causes the third point which is lack of transparency there is no transparency between a uh, ticket management system the fourth point is data privacy as we all know like in ticket management system user sensitive uh, information is taken so there may be data breaches and there may be loss of uh, private uh, information so the aim of this project is to address these issues by developing a dap which is decentralized application that is based on blockchain technology and uh, that provides secure and uh, transparent ticketing management system next slide yeah but why blockchain so there are some advantages of using blockchain so the first advantage is security because a uh, blockchain provides a highly secure and tamper resistant system and its uh, transaction and ownership records are stored across distributed nodes uh, it makes hard for a hacker to hack the system uh the next is transparency all the records are display, uh, displayed uh, in public 
so that's why uh, everyone knows uh, who bought the ticket and uh, their respective ids the next is uh, smart contracts so the smart contracts are self executing code on blockchain that automatically run when the terms of conditions are uh, fulfilled and uh, here the smart contracts does what smart contract does is, is handles event creation tickets uh, it's a uh, ticket sales and ticket transfers the next is a uh, reduced cost and efficiency yeah because there are no intermediaries involved the cost are uh, very significantly reduced and the next is global accessibility because the blockchain is distributed uh, on a uh, distributed network that is why anyone with internet can access this so there are no geographical boundaries attached when using blockchain next slide so but what is blockchain actually so blockchain is a decentralized digital ledger which is immutable transparent and tamper proof so uh, the way it works is um, all the transactions are stored on a block and when the block is full the block is added to a blockchain and when it's added to a blockchain it can't be altered next slide please so let's understand uh, what uh, smart contracts really are so smart contracts are nothing but the terms and conditions between buyer and sellers that, that are written into a code so let's uh, move have a walk through let's let's uh, think of it with an example let's say there are two people alice and bob and they want some terms uh, terms and condition to be met and when the terms and conditions are met uh, the alice uh, alice will uh, pay bob 20 dollars so what will happen is uh, bob will create a smart contract and deploy it on blockchain now once it's deployed on blockchain we can't change it now if the event takes place and the terms and conditions are valid then automatically uh, the smart contract will transfer 20 dollars from alice to bob and when once this block is attached to the blockchain the settlement is done so that's how event management takes place next slide so the tools used are uh, metamask metamask is nothing but a digital wallet the next is a remix id where uh, we wrote our uh, smart contracts the next is ethereum ethereum is a public blockchain uh, where we deployed our smart contracts and we also use html javascript and css to create the front end of our application Next slide. Over to you, Rushen. Yeah, thank you, Parth. Uh, now talking about the features of our uh, project. So the basic feature which others are provided are that we can create an event, buy tickets, transfer ticket, view event, or the tickets. It, it can show the tickets you own, like uh, the book my show app, or we can say the other booking show app. But what makes us differ from that app? That is because of the blockchain. So here where what the blockchain comes in handy. So what, it, what are the benefits of it? That the attendee transaction are given a particular unique ID. So whenever you do a transaction on a smart contract, it generates an address in it. I will show you in the results how the address is generated. So it generates an address uh, which is unique and it is stored in a blockchain. So no one can interfere in your particular transaction and no one can hack your details from it. And the second is data may be collected without any personal identification information. There is no more information needed for a particular user uh, to get an access of a ticket or to buy a ticket. Next is it has fast and efficient transaction as there is no middleman. It can directly using blockchain and smart contract. You can directly uh, take the tickets and a verified identity is there. And also as my colleague said, it cannot be hacked. So the technology used in it has many layers. So how hacking is done? When we hack something, we hack by layer by layer. So first we hack first layer, then second layer, then third layer. But uh, in blockchain, whenever we hack the first layer, so another million layers are created, which, are, which is a lot uh, of a tedious stuff to do for a hacker. So it cannot be hacked. It is nearly impossible for a hacker to hack. Next is the result. So this is how our UI looks like. This is the uh, uh, like the home page of our UI. This is the de uh, decentralized app which we have created. This is using the Solidity app. So as here you can see, this is for the two users. First one who can buy tickets or second one who can create the uh, event. And here is the transaction ticket which generates the unique ID which I was talking about the address. And this is the remix ID. Uh, our uh, like open source, which is the remix idea of open source coding platform where we have uh, deployed our code. So coming on to the con conclusion. So basically uh, we have used blockchain in event management because obviously web, web 3.0 is something which is uh, on boom. Everybody wants to move on that, pl that platform. Everyone wants to use blockchain technology, which is highly secured and uh, wants to reverse revolutionize the uh, whole uh, internet thing. So that's why. And also there is no middleman in the case uh, for, uh, so we have employed the blockchain technology and all the transactions are governed by the return contracts, as I said. 
and moreover to talk about the use of blockchain technology even management as well as the future research perspective uh, these are some literature survey i have added only two because this is what we are focusing on the future scope also the first one is for the analyzing the identity and second one is the data immutability so here uh, using the internet of thing also uh, we can uh, at in one second 12.5 transaction can be at a time at a time in one second 12.5 transaction can be uh, like process and record incoming uh, i will also like to acknowledge our colleagues and also the hod of multidisciplinary department of vishwakarma institute of technology for okay. giving us an opportunity and guiding uh, guiding us thank you okay okay rishal can you tell me what is the future scope of this uh, of this project yeah that's what i was saying uh, so here uh, as you can see the data immutability so uh, our data is uh, uh, like here you can see when we buy tickets and do it the when we go on a particular event let's say you have book a movie theater movie theater, theater ticket you go on that particular event so to check it instead of having a particular person to check your ticket there is one system known as the uh, data immutability thing which we can add of internet of thing in which at a second uh, like it can prevent us from the queuing system uh, instead of having a long queue at a time many uh, many uh, like addresses can be tally or we can say get confirmed for the uh, entrance of a particular movie theater okay okay and also Thank we can you. add one uh, yeah let's go on go on yeah we can also add one feedback and uh, feedback option in it because blockchain technology is new to people to get more feedbacks from the people it is it is necessary feedback is necessary for any project so it should yeah. be there yeah okay. okay thank you so much rushal thank you sir uh, we'll move to the next author now so next we have varad joshi and his yes, paper sir. title is navigating the complexities of cryptography trends problems and solutions uh, varad you may share your screen please yes sir is my screen visible yes it's visible you've got eight minutes oh. so good afternoon everyone Uh, the title of my paper is the navigating the complexities of cryptography its trends problems and solutions so myself varad joshi i have recently completed my bachelor's in lok jagruti kendra university from bsc it and i have created this paper under the mentorship of dr shanti verma the abstract of my paper is uh, this paper is basically for a, a study paper and is used for uh, knowing the recent trends and the problems regarding it and how to solve it so let's just start with the introduction the meaning of cryptography cryptography means uh, to just a second sorry sorry the cryptography means uh, to encrypt and decrypt the data there are basically two types of cryptography first is the symmetric cryptography and the asymmetric cryptography, uh, cryptography. let's just talk about it symmetric cryptography uses a single key to encrypt and decrypt the data while the asymmetric cryptography uses the two different keys to encrypt and decrypt the data one is for the uh, uh, sender side and one is for the receiver side now if we talk about the trends the first trend uh, that come to our mind is the blockchain technology as you all know blockchain is a decentralized ledger which can be uh, nearly impossible to tamper so there are basically three different uh, methods in blockchain technology which can be used in cryptography first is the public key cryptography this type of cryptography is also known as an asymmetric cryptography in which one key is publicly uh, announced to everyone while the other key is secretly and only be given to the receiver's end that can uh, this can make the security more powerful the second method is the zero knowledge proof in this type of cryptography method uh, the data can be processed in an encrypted form only there is no need for decrypt the data and then uh, to process it this makes the uh, the data uh, processing a uh, more time efficiently the third method is the hash function as we all know the hash function is uh, the one way pseudo random algebraic expressions which can tamper the data and make it nearly impossible to de decrypt without any authorized access now let's talk about the second which was the quantum resistance cryptography as we all know the quantum computers are nearly new in our era so uh, it is uh, really challenging for the Uh, resist uh, for the attackers to attack on the quantum computers and this uh, quantum resistance cryptography used 
to resist the attackers uh, from uh, attacking the computer to tam uh, and tamper with the data. Uh, this type of cryptography uh, blocks both normal cryptography and the quantum resistance cryptography. Uh, so there are few cryptography which was uh, recently published by NIST, which was the National Institute of Standards uh, and Technology, which are, which are the static code hash uh, isogeny and the multi uh, multivariate. Now we'll uh, now let's talk about the homo homomorphic en encryption. In homomorphic encryption, the data can be uh, processed in an encrypted form only, and at the time of the result, it decrypt and give the result to the users. This is currently most used cryptographic method in the today's world. Now, as for the last uh, and the not last but the, not least but the last trend, the post quantum cryptography. This is also used to design the resistance of the com uh, attack of the com quantum computers. But now the question is arise that what is the difference between quantum resistance cryptography and the post quantum cryptography? The quantum resistance uh, resistance cryptography can uh, block both the attackers and normal attackers and the quantum computer attackers, while the post quantum cryptography only blocks the newly cryptographic method and the quantum attack uh, quantum computer attacks. Now, if we talk about the problems in the cryptography, so the first problem come in our mind is the key management, which is also the core of the cryptography. So uh, first uh, problem is the hardware oriented authentication. Uh, this is the type of problem which we generally faces uh, at the time of a multinational companies like the person tampered the data using external devices like rubber ducky USBs or the uh, or by using the frequency of the electric uh, electricity one can know the encryption key of a particular persons. Now if we talk about the second method then it is a key, session key cryptograph uh, session key. This problem is generally used while using a VPN or a secured message apps. Uh, like for example, if you want to send a message to a particular user, but because of so much uh, key uh, and at a particular server, the session might uh, transfer to some other person, which we also know by the long uh, long time ago, uh, cross connections of the cordless, in which we uh, uh, convey some message to the others, but some other person received it. Just like that, the secure message app works. The second is virtual private network uh, VPNs. We all, we all use VPNs as we know that because of some uh, network connectivity issue, VP or VPN got uh, disconnected because of that. The session we are currently in got disconnected also and the session uh, might go got error fault while we try to reconnect it. The, la, uh, the third now we key, C is key managing key. Uh, as you all know, the key management is crucial for the uh, cryptography. Uh, sometimes in a server because of so much loading of the keys, the uh, server might got confused and give the access to the wrong person or the wrong entities. So as we see, as you all know that the HTTPS needs a certificate to be verified and the HTTP dot did not uh, did not need for any certificate. So if the server, uh, if the server has so, so many loads, then it can also give the access of uh, HTTPS to the simple HTTP website. This may uh, cause the misleading information to the other also. Now let's talk about the other problems also. The first one is standardization. As you all know, the cryptography is a very complex field. And because of the, uh, these many algorithms and uh, different types of methods were created, but not all the algorithms can be uh, uh, can be uh, sorry, it can be uh, capable in a one single computer because of that, the intercompatibility issues may arise as we all have seen this one type of issues called DLEC DRBG is a basically an uh, algorithm that was created by NIST, which was after 15 to 20 years, we come to know that there is a backdoor in that security, which was created by the uh, uh, national committee itself, uh, because there due to uh, to tamper the data with the to tamper the personal data. Now let's, uh, let's talk about the other problems. The other problem is the awareness as we all know that the cryptography what, what is cryptography, but we don't know how important it is or how it can be implemented or how much can be implemented. And because of that, uh, the loss of data may be happened. Now uh, we have talked now let's talk about the solutions. The first solution come into the mind is multi-factor authentication. We all have seen the multi-factor authentication uh, authentications like OTP or the SMS or biometrics. This all can be uh, used to, in the cryptography. And second Hold is the, drop, uh, Bharat, sir. Uh, just one minute left. Uh, please conclude as soon as. Yes, sir. The second is the uh, secret key cryptography. It is also known as symmetric key as we have seen. 
the third one is the public key cryptography uh, is also known as a symmetric uh, cryptography which we all have seen in the previous time uh, this is just an example of it and the hash function as we have seen in the blockchain technology this is uh, SHA-3 and SHA-256 are the most used algorithms uh, using hash in hash function which are currently used the next we see is smart grains and smart meters we, uh, authentications which uh, can uh, give the user use it can give the unauthorized user a many uh, of our data using the electricity frequencies and the MSCs. the second is the chaos based system. one this type of system cannot be tempered because it is a uh, build with the ideas of blockchain technology and which a simple change make a whole system many more chaotic than than ever the second is the key management as we have seen because of the session keys of and the because of the session keys uh, merging and the too many loads on the key might not be good for the any of the cryptography the last one is the blockchain technology as we have uh, seen it has been used in the bitcoins and the ethereums which are the cryptocurrencies uh, to make them safely transfer to the transaction uh, make it transfer to the other tra transaction then we have talk about the carry bros is it is a tool created by the mit which is basically an internet protocol which uh, authenticate the client which are using then unauthorized un unsecured network there are basically six type in it first is a client uh, send a request to the server second uh, is the server uh, sees the client and give an uh, tgt which means ticket granting ticket and a session key to the client then client send tgt to the tgt service and then the tgt service send a session key to the client and se client send the session key again to the server with the resources that he want and then server allows the authorized client access as for the conclusion of this uh, paper uh, the trends must be uh, known and the problems and the solutions must be aware by the every person because the world is going in a digital era and the privacy is much more uh, important than a per, uh, person's life thank you uh, many uh, methods you, you yes sorry ma'am you have uh, described various methods of cryptography here yes ma'am which one is best method according to you a uh, hash function in blockchain because uh, uh, because uh, in hash function blockchain basically blockchain is an a block uh, is a straight line and there is a blocks on the simultaneously blocks on both the sides of the thread and uh, every block contains a, a hash value of a previous block which make it much more uh, safer than the other cryptographic methods and what is the future scope of this study uh, basically uh, to know the trends about how the data can be uh, protected and why the data has got breaches uh, because uh, do you know the data uh, world is going in a digital era and if we don't get in our privacy then it might trouble us in the future thank you thank you ma'am thank you varad uh, thank you vijeta ma'am let's move to the next author and the next author is t kavya tanisha and her paper title is nice navgrah iconography classification engine yes sir can you hear me kavya yes sir yes i can hear you please share your screen Good afternoon, everybody. Today's presentation is about Navagraha Iconography Classification Engine, and my paper ID is one three three. Under the guidance of guidance of Dr. C. Sindhu, myself, Kavit Anisha, I'm here to present our paper. Basically, our idea is based on classification of nine Navagraha idols. Navagraha are a group of nine celestial bodies that worked that are worshipped in Hindu religion. In the recent years, several sculptures and statues of these Navagrahas have been discovered in India, making it difficult in identification. Hinduism is a complex religion with diverse beliefs. Each body in the Navagraha idols is believed to have profound impact on human faith. In the identification of these idols, deep learning and convolutional neural network played a major role. The motor behind doing this paper is identification of Navagraha idols holds several important aspects in Hindu astrology. By understanding Navagraha gods, astrologers can interpret the influence of celestial bodies on individual lives and also can provide remedies to navigate through challenges. And for all those who do, and all for the devotees who visit these temples to seek blessings, it helps in deeper understanding. 
The main problem statement can be identified as a recognition of these nine Navagraha idols. And our objective is to recognize the Navagraha gods based on its unique characteristics, characteristics and the study aims to draw comparisons and ultimately institute an efficient model. We are the first one to implement ResNet 50 architecture in data recognition and sculpture recognition as a whole. When compared with other architectures like ResNet 50, VGG 16, and MobileNet, ResNet 50 has more accuracy in the identification. These are the nine Navagraha gods, namely Buddha, Chandra, Rahu, Surya, Ketu, Mangal, Shukra, Shani, Rihaspati. Here are a few other papers that use different architectures such as convolutional neural networks, Euclidean at distance method, which resulted in the following accuracies. This is the overall proposed architecture diagram for Navagraha iconography classification of India. Our architecture mainly includes data acquisition, image processing, feature acquisition, extraction, image recognition with machine learning, and results. And the first or initial stage is image acquisition. To train the model, primary most step is to collect varied variety data set of images of all nine Navagraha gods. That includes different postures, angles, and conditions. These images have been obtained from different sources, such as capturing them through various devices and online also. This is the data subset of Bhispati God, one among the nine Navagraha gods that has been used to train the model. Moving on to the next stage, it's pre-processing. This is a significant step in classification of Navagraha that involves, involve, that involves resizing all the images to 224 cross 224 pixels. Since the preferred size of ResNet 50 is 224 cross 224, flipping, rotation, brightness correction, and adjustment of exposure is applied on all the data sets. Coming to the main architecture, various architectures such as ResNet 50, MobileNet, and VGG are used. ResNet 50 is a popular convolutional neural network architecture used for image classification. It consists of 50 layers divided into several parts, each with specific function. There are many layers such as input layer, max pooling layer, residual blocks. Each layer plays a significant role in detecting the patterns. The BGG 16 architecture is known for its simplicity and depth. It contains 16 layers, including 13 convolutional layers and three fully connected layers. In contrast, MobileNet is a lightweight and efficient convolutional neural network designed using depth-wise separable convolutions and linear bottlenecks, which helps to reduce computational complexity and model size while increasing efficiency. And this is the sample output. A sample output consists of two things, name of the god and the accuracy. This is the comparison table between the three architectures, ResNet 50, MobileNet, and BJJ. It clearly shows that ResNet 50 has higher accuracy and less loss. Coming to conclusion, different architectures give different accuracies, as we have seen in the above table. Among all three of them, ResNet 50 has higher accuracy, which tells that ResNet 50 is the most suitable model for our project. By utilizing ResNet 50, we achieved impressive accuracy in detecting deities and sculptures. Overall, this research provides valuable insights into image classification methods for recognizing deities. With the ability to accurately identify and categorize Navagraha gods, researchers can better understand the cultural and historical significance in, of India's cultures. In future, we would like to diversify our project into different, into different idols such as Buddhism or Jainism and all. As of now, we are st sticking to nine Navagraha gods. These are the few reference papers. Thank you. Okay, Kavya. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you give very good presentation and your title is very good. Thank you. Very nice uh, uh, presentation you give. Uh, okay. What is the, basically uh, the future scope of this, uh, uh, this paper? Ma'am, as of now, we are constrained to only these nine Navagraha gods, ma'am. In future, we would like to yes. diversify our project into various uh, religion and various god sculptures also, and also in different countries as well, ma'am. Hmm. By using the image process? Yeah, by using ResNet 50 architecture. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gavya. Uh, we'll move to the next author. <clears throat> and we have G. Shanmukh Srinivasa Reddy 
and his paper title is rice leaf disease detection using different models and comparative analysis uh, can you hear me mr reddy no response from his side so let's move to the next author so now we have kavya n and her paper title is the secured system for continuous improvement in educational institutes using big data analytics yes sir uh kavya can you please present your screen yes sir is my screen visible yes it's visible you may start uh, my paper title is uh, our paper title is the secured system for continuous improvement in educational institute using big data analytics and it is by kavya and mansa s and professor professor shriyari mr sir sjs it chikbalapur india and manjunath sir bms it bangalore and mayesh mr sir ncet bangalore india these are the contents we are going to discuss and it is abstract uh, the data is not just a four letter word in a present real world environment as we consider big data it takes a new part in a technology uh, big data in education using the hadoop platform it's for evaluation of the performance of the student and we are having uh, visualization and enhancing the performance of the institute uh, and also the educational institute faces several problems in enhancing the student performance Uh, and bringing effectiveness to student performance so the adobe platform in big data gives an effective improvement in performance in an educational institution and the introduction to the paper nowadays data is getting generated from different versatile sources in enormous volume the data generated from the sources such as internet mobile phones institutions etc is not in a structured format the traditional computing system cannot process and analyze huge data so we required separate tools and technique here we are going to use big data analytics for the processing and uh, analyzing the data big data means a large data set that cannot be processed by traditional computing techniques uh, and big data is a set of technologies created to store analyze and manage the bulk data uh next is the problem statement uh is nowadays big data analytics is widely used in education sector for retaining a large amount of data of analysis visualization decision making etc of student performance in a secure manner uh so in a secure manner is a challenging so the proposed system is to build a web application that is built based upon the big data hadoop framework also uses the map reduce for efficient performance and security is given by using the coveros it is the main intention of the proposing title and the proposed system works on increasing the performance of educational institute it may be the student or the whole educational institute the methodology we are used is one is the collaborative filtering map reduce kerberos vedar and the scope collaborative filtering collaborative filtering is a technique which is used for identifying the relationship between the pieces of data uh, this is frequently used in the recommender system of uh, for example if a student a and b likes the course maths and the student b likes the course science the science can be recommended to the student a this is the one of the technique we can uh, implement in the project collaborative filtering uh, the next is map reduce the map reduce is mainly used to uh, maintain the data uh, so map reduce is a big data analysis model that process the data sets using a parallel algorithm on computer cl clusters and also uh, it is distributed processing and the parallel processing uh, in the educational institute we have the large amount of da data it may be related to the teacher student also uh, it may be the institution data which which will be in the shuffled manner we should uh, organize the data regarding the teacher or regarding the student or regarding the institute so the map reduce is used map reduce program work in a two phases namely map and reduce map task deal with the splitting or mapping of the data while reduce task shuffle and reduce the data this is how it works and the next one is kerberos the security is provided using the kerberos kerberos is a computer network security protocol and uh, the kerberos comprises with the three components uh, mainly that authentication server uh, ticket granting server and the kerberos database uh, in client 
will send the login message to the authentication server. Uh, the authentication server will uh, authenticate the user and uh, sends the ticket granting server which was in encrypted format. When Once the client decrypted it, and it uh, again, it will send to the authentication server. Authentication server will send the server message to the ticket granting server. Ticket granting server will send the client to server ticket. So client can uh, access with the server. This is uh, this Kerberos security is applied to the database. And next is a VEDAR. VEDAR is a sentimental analysis, valency aware dictionary for sentiment reasoning is an NLTK module that provides the sentiment scores based on the words used. Uh, in these, uh, the feedback provided by the student that is analyzed, like in this system, VEDAR is used for the analysis of the student performance in every subject. Based on the feedback received from the student, the sentiment analysis is done. And based on that, the uh, uh, notes or a video is recommended by the teacher. And next is Scoop. Scoop is a utility for transferring large amount of data between Hadoop and outside data store like relational database. Mainly the Scoop is used to migrating the data from databases to the Hadoop framework. Uh, so the Scoop is used. And these are some results and discussions. As we know, our traditional system for storing the data such as RDBMS or and MySQLs are lagging in the speed of loading the data, mainly the large amount of data. Uh, these are the, uh, some example in size. Uh, this is uh, the loading time in RDBMS and the loading time in Hadoop is shown in the table. If the data size is 0.5, RDBMS take around 2.78 minutes to load and Hadoop uh, takes the time 1.39. Uh, so Hadoop will have the more less time to load the data, load the large amount of data. And this is the graph uh, of the Hadoop and RDBMS varies in loading time. And conclusion, the main agenda is to build a web application using big data Hadoop framework, which also contains the MapReduce technique for enhancing the performance of the students, increasing the student results, admissions, etc. Since Hadoop framework is used, it is open source and used for storing large amount of data. It is easy to process the data. And uh, Scoop is used for migrating the data base from RDBMS to Hadoop. As overall, if we come to a query time or loading time, Hadoop is better than RDBMS. Thank you. Uh, my first question is, what is the collaborative filtering? Uh, collaborative filtering, as I said, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a technique used for identifying the relationship between the pieces of data. As I took an example, if user A and user B likes a math and user B like a science, uh, science can be recommended to the user A also, ma'am. Okay, uh, technology can uh, store the, uh, the data in a very big size. So what is the concept of storage in Hadoop? Ma'am, I didn't get you, ma'am. Uh, on your uh, last, uh, come to the, your last slide, conclusion slide. Result and discussion. Uh, Hadoop technology you are using, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So where the data is stored? What is the storage uh, storage concept in this Hadoop? Hadoop, Hadoop framework is used, ma'am. In the Hadoop, it is mm -hmm. an open source fam, uh, framework. Uh, in the Hadoop, mm -hmm. we are storing, ma'am, in a clusters, live nodes. In the, in the cluster. Okay. In the form of clusters. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 Thank you, Kavya. Next so one. I think with Thank this, we come to the end. Uh, there's just one last call for Somabha and G Shanmukh. If you are in the presentation, if you are with us on Zoom, you may please share your screen. And no response from the, them. So I think, ma'am, uh, we come to the conclusion of this session. I sincerely thank all our authors for their excellent presentation in this session and all our participants for being a part of this international conference. I hope this session was informative enough and we on behalf of the whole team, thank you for the support during this eighth version and the previous seven versions of the conference. And we will be happy to see you in the, see you in the ninth version the next year as well. All the presenters would be getting their digital certificates through their emails within two days uh, two working days and further 
all the papers have been sent to the springer and the publication will be live within 6 months kindly cooperate with the team of ICT 4SG 2023 i also thank our session chair dr vijeta for chairing this session and uh, for as a token of appreciation we have a certificate for you ma'am as well from ICT 4SG 2023 thank you for being with us ma'am and do you want to say something as we conclude with this session uh thank you so much thank you so much for inviting me and uh, it was very informative uh, session uh, all the participants uh, uh, gave a very good presentation and with a good uh, paper so uh, definitely it is a good experience for me uh thank you so much and uh, thank you so much for this token of appreciation Thank you so much, ma'am. It was an honor yeah. to have you here with us. I now request uh, each and every participant to please turn on your cameras so that we can click a quick snapshot. Yeah. Please, whosoever is comfortable in uh, turning on your cameras, please do so. I'll wait for ten more seconds and then I'll click a snapshot. Mm -hmm. भरत जोशी गौरावी जानवी डॉक्टर अपिता पटेल काव्य तनिशा ओके आई थिंक दीज मेनी आर देयर सो जस्ट वन टू एंड थैंक यू सो मच एवरीवन होप यू हैव अ ग्रेट ईयर अहेड थैंक यू एंड होप टू सी यू नेक्स्ट ईयर वेल Thank you, Amrita. Yeah. So Thank you.